welcome to today's live session with me again. Um, again, it's Thursday night, and we are back to talk about a lot of stuff, important stuff about PTE and in general English language. So uh, before we get started with today's topic, let's just take some time and say hi to each other. So if you're watching today's live session here with us, just comment in the chat box, maybe hi. Um, let us know how you're doing so far, how has been your week. So this way we know you are here with all of us. Um, it really brings confidence. Um, um, what? what? Uh, hi, hi, Tina. Um, I was looking forward to get a message from you like in the comment box um, because yeah, you are always here supporting us in every Thursday night um, and it's really nice um, to have you consistently every week. I hope um, today's session is going to be really helpful for you as well, um, as well as for other viewers because in today's session, we are going to cover some really, really important stuff, um, interesting as well. We are going to cover some common mistakes that all the time people make, um, even native speakers make these mistakes. We are going to also talk about some read aloud mistakes that usually people do um, and how to overcome that problem. Um, and also we are going to bust one more PTE myth that is very common among all the test takers um, who are preparing for PTE or who have given PTE already maybe once or twice, they have this kind of misconception about PTE and we are gonna bust that as well. So yeah, welcome everyone. Um, you can have a pen and paper ready with you as well if you want to take some note um, about anything that we go through in today's session. So um, let's get started. Let me just quickly share my screen like always um, and start talking about all the topics for tonight. All right, let's start with first important thing, um, which is mistakes that usually we people make in speaking and writing. Um, we are going to talk about 13 very common, very simple mistakes. Um, that we do in, while we are speaking with other people, we are writing our essays, for example, in PDE, or maybe writing um, right from dictation, or maybe using these words um, in fill in the blanks in the reading section, anywhere, wherever you have the chance of using these words, make sure you're from today onwards, you don't make the same mistake because we're gonna discuss those things today. Um, and we're gonna talk in detail uh, why these confusions usually arise and how to fix that, all right? The first mistake that people usually make is with which or that. Um, both words have the same kind of meaning, um, but the use of these two words are quite different um, depending on the kind of information you're giving to other people. All right, so which, when you want to use the word which, you use which uh, when you are saying something to someone, uh, but also adding some extra information. So it's nice to know some extra information, but if you don't say that, it's not going to be a huge loss. So in those kind of situations where you are adding non-essential information in your sentences, you use which. Um, on the contrary, if you are adding some important information um, without which your sentence doesn't have own meaning, doesn't have its own importance, then you use that, all right? So that is compulsory, but which is optional. So for example, let's look at an example. Um, for example, if you look at the first sentence under the box of which my phone, which is an iPhone, isn't working. So the main message of the sentence is my phone is not working. Adding the extra bit of information that it's an iPhone is, is non-essential. Like it's good to know, but even if I didn't know it, it's still fine still I get the message that your phone is not working. So we add which in non-essential information when we add those type of information in our sentences. 
And another important thing when you are adding which in a sentence is that you put a comma before and after that part. So when you are writing something with which, before you start that part, you put a comma. And after you finish that part, you put a comma again because it shows it is not essential. It's not that important. Um, and even without this part, the sentence can have its own meaning. On the opposite side, we have that. So that we use when we are adding essential information in a sentence. For example, the boy that is in your class is my brother. Okay. So if we say the boy is my brother, it doesn't have um, important information like, all right, yeah, okay, what, what is the big deal about it? But when we add the information that the boy who is in your class, so that's an essential information. That's how we get, we get an idea about which boy we are talking about. Um, so here, that is very important. Without this part, the, the sentence cannot stand on its own. So when you're adding that, it means it's an essential information in your sentence. And another thing about that is you don't have to put any comma before or after that. Because it's essential, it's just a part of the main sentence. Unlike which, because which is not essential part of the sentence. So that's the basic difference between which and that. So make sure next time when you are adding some information um, in a sentence, think about it if it's essential or non-essential and then choose your which or that accordingly. Let's talk about next pair of words. Emigrate and immigrant. This is also something even native speakers um, make a lot of mistakes with when they are using um, these two words in writing. Um, so from my personal experience while um, training native speakers, I realized like, I really need to put these two words here because it, it means pretty similar things, even though these both words are different. For example, when you want to use emigrate with E in the beginning, it just means you are leaving your own country. It means nothing else. So if I say my grandmother emigrated from Paris, it just means my grandmother left Paris from her own country, from her own um, birth land. So that is emigrate. Um, but if you use immigrate with I in the beginning, it means going to some other new country, oops, going to some other new country to live. So immigrate, if we look at the first picture, we can realize when we are using emigrate with E, it just means buy. You're, you're leaving your own country uh, to live somewhere else. But when we say immigrate with I, it just means hello. It just means um, you are being welcomed in a new country or you are saying hello to the people of a new country where you have come to live, all right? So that's the basic difference. Um, when you are focusing on the fact that you are leaving your own country, based on that focus, use emigrate. But when you are focusing that, you have come to a new country to survive, to live, to earn money, um, to settle down, then use immigrate with I. So these two are quite not the same thing. So don't use these two words interchangeably because they have quite a, you know, quite a very difference in their, in their meaning. So that's immigrate and immigrate. All right, let's talk about next one. On versus on to. This is another thing that we use interchangeably all the time in our writing. And we don't even realize there is a difference between on and onto um, when we use those things in our sentences. So firstly, both are prepositions, all right? Both shows, both of the words show um, a position of something or someone. So on means when we are saying um, something is on the table or I'm sitting on the top of a mountain. Like we, when we are using on, it just simply means 
where you are located, where you are sitting or what you are doing in a specific position, all right? It has nothing else going on with it. Um, just take a break and look at the comment box from Fan and Duke. Hi, everyone. Um, so hi, Fan and Duke. I hope both of you are doing well. Um, and how was your week to both of you, Fan and Duke? Let us know. All right, coming back to our topic. So when we use on, it just simply means a position, nothing else, a position or location of something or someone. For example, the ball is on the box. The dog is sitting on the chair. It just means where the ball is. It just means where the dog is, nothing else. But when we use on to, like if I say the ball jumped onto the box or the cat jumped onto the chair, um, with the word on to, we have on and we have to. And when we have to, it just means something is moving, all right? Something uh, has some kind of movement. So if I say the ball jumped onto the box, it shows some kind of movement, like it is jumping onto the box. Or if I say the cat jumped onto the chair, it just shows an action. The cat simply is just not sitting on the top of the chair, but before that, what it did, it jumped. So it's showing some kind of action. So that's the basic difference. With on, there is no movement um, included. It just shows the location of something. With onto, when you use onto before that, when you are using a verb, you have to use a verb which shows action, um, some kind of movement, okay? That's the basic difference. So choose wisely next time. Uh, from fun, it's helpful today's topic. Yay, I'm so happy to know that fun. Make sure you take note if you if you think taking notes are going to help is taking note is going to help you feel free to take note because you know these are the words that we all the time speak use uh, without even realizing there is a difference um so we all are trying to be better english speakers right um so yeah so on and on to both are very different. It's not the same. So don't use it in the same way from next time you are trying to use these two words. Let's move on uh, to our different top, different pair of words. This one. Oh my God, this, this, this one is pretty confusing. Every day versus every day. With space in the middle and without any space in the middle every day and every day there is a difference all right um even though the word is exactly the same one space in the middle makes a whole lot of difference um and if you don't know that yet let's get to know it so first thing when you use the word every day without any space uh as one word remember all the time that one is adjective all right, and we use that before we use a noun in a sentence. But when you as uh, when you write every day with a space in the middle, that's not adjective. That's just an adverb talking about the frequency, talking about your timetable of doing something. Okay, let's look at some examples that will help you to understand it better. So if, if we look at the second picture on the right-hand side of my slide, every day without any space is an adjective. So if I say she is wearing everyday clothes or stress is just a part of everyday life. So we are just talking about the kind of clothes she wears, the quality of the clothes, which is an adjective. And we are also talking about stress, which is a part of everyday life. So we are also talking about the kind of life, everyday life, regular life, um, 
ordinary life. So we are talking about the quality of life. So this way, when you want to use the word before the noun in a sentence, you use everyday without any space because that's an adjective. So every time the way you use an adjective, you're going to use the word everyday without any space in the middle. All right. Um, but everyday with a space, it just means uh, the frequency of something. For example, I do my maths homework every day. So how often do I do my homework? Every day. I get up for work every day at six. So how often I get up at six? Every day. So when you are using every day to talk about frequency of doing something, then we use that every day with a space. But when we want to use every day to talk about the quality of something, um, in that sense, we use every day without any space because that, that just becomes an adjective. So yeah, um, when you are writing an essay, for example, um, in your PTE test, uh, and you want to talk about what is happening around the world nowadays, and if you're writing in everyday life, we use mobile phones, for example. In this sentence, when we say in everyday life, we use mobile phone, we will use every day without any space because it just shows what type of life, a quality. Um, so that's when in the sentence, it's, a, it's an adjective. Um, so when you're using it this way in your writing, make sure you know what you are trying to say. Are you trying to talk about the frequency or are you going to talk about um, or describe something or someone, or the quality of something or someone? Based on that, choose your word with space or without space. Okay. Um, let's talk about next pair of words, explicit or implicit. Again, both are quite different, but I have seen people to use both words interchangeably without realizing what's the difference between two words. So explicit means when you say something to someone directly without any hide and seek, uh, without beating around the bush. And implicit means the opposite. When you say something to someone indirectly, Bidding around the bush. So, for example, if I say, if you don't give me a pay rise, I'll leave. So, if um, you are working somewhere and you are not happy with the payment and you are telling your boss or employer, like, look, I'm done with it. If you don't give me a pay rise, I'm going to leave because that's beyond my ability at the moment. I can't work with this pay. That's very explicit, very direct, very clearly saying. But on the opposite side, if you want to be like a little bit nice um, and you don't want to be very obvious, very strict about something, you can say the same thing in a very indirect way. So you can say, if you don't show more appreciation, I'll review my options. Okay, so indirectly, this person is saying, if you don't show appreciation, it means if you don't give me more value, if you don't, uh, you know, increase my payment and show appreciation for whatever I'm doing for your business, I'll review the options. Um, I'm going to look for other options. It means maybe I'll just quit your job because it, I'm done with it. So it's just a nice way, a sober way of saying something. So it means um, not very straight, implied. So that's the difference between explicit and implicit. So implicit is indirect and explicit is very direct, too direct, all right? So that's the difference between explicit and implicit. Let's talk about I and me. Um, also, I have seen to use both of these words in a wrong way when people speak, especially um, in English. Um, and they have a difference. Even though I means me, me means I, both have the same meaning. But depending on the situation, depending on the context, um, depending on the kind of thing you are trying to say, 
um, there would be a difference uh, between I and me. So basically, I is a subject and me is an object pronoun. So when you're writing I, like I speak in English every day, so I is a subject pronoun. But when I say um, something has happened to me, me is an object in the sentence because it's not in the beginning, it's in the end. So that's an object pronoun. If you're confused about these two, like when to use what, just think in your mind, who is doing the action? All right. Is it I or is it someone else? Because if you are doing the action, you will be using I. If you are not doing the option, but you are involved in some way in that situation, then you will be the object. For example, Jeremy hit the ball to me or I. What would I say? Jeremy hit the ball to me or Jeremy hit the ball to I. It can be a little bit confusing, but who is doing the action in the sentence? Jeremy is doing the action because he is hitting the ball. He is in, he is in the mood of action. I'm not doing anything. So here, Jeremy is the subject and me is the object. So the main sentence is going to be, Jeremy hit the ball to me because I'm not the subject. I'm not doing any action. Jeremy is doing the action. He is the subject. So when I'm going to use about, when I'm going to talk about myself, I'm going to use the object pronoun, me, not I. So from next time, if you are confused about using I and me, just ask yourself, what is happening in this sentence? Um, am I doing something important? Am I doing the action? Or someone else is doing the action and I'm just tagging alone. I'm just there. I'm just present and I'm just involved. And that's it. Uh, depending on that, choose I or me. I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, and it's being useful for all of you to clear your confusions. Just let me know in the chat that you are still here with me. Um, I really appreciate that. All right, let's talk about um, our topic. Obtain versus attain. Again, meaning is quite similar, but there is, again, there is a difference. Um, you can't use one or other in every situation. Um, there is a significant difference in the meaning of obtain and attain. So when you want to use obtain, it just simply means you are trying to earn something, you are trying to gain something materialistic, all right, something tangible, which you can see, you can touch, uh, you can purchase, uh, you can control, you can possess, something like that. But when you're talking about attaining something, it's not materialistic. It's like um, gaining something, like gaining popularity, achieving success, accomplishing a task. So it's for non-tangible entities. It's for non-tangible stuff where you can't see it is. It's just a feeling. It's just an achievement, uh, something, um, something like a quality. Like, for example, if you pass your PDE test, you have accomplished success. So that's attaining. Um, but the certificate that you are going to get after passing PDE, the score report card, um, that is something that you have obtained. So which is materialistic, which you, which you can touch, which you can see by your eyes, that's obtained, materialistic. But when you are talking about something um, that you can't see, um, that you can just feel a quality, that's when we use attain. And also, one and another important thing is when we are talking about attaining something, it generally means you're giving more hard work compared to obtaining something. So it requires greater effort than obtaining something. So obviously, if you want to... Um, achieve success in life, it's not the same as obtaining a mobile phone from, from a shop, right? You can easily buy a phone and obtain it. 
uh, it doesn't require a lot of effort. But at the same time, if you want to be successful in your own business, if you're if you want to be someone successful in passing the PTE test, it requires greater effort um, than simply just obtaining and purchasing something. So next time when you're using or being confused between obtaining and attaining something, just ask yourself if this is something materialistic, uh, something that I can easily purchase or buy or control, or is it something that requires a lot more things um, simply than bu buying something? It requires dedication, it requires punctuality, it requires hard work, it requires re uh, uh, you know perseverance, um, a lot of qualities. In those uh, situations, you use attain, not obtain. So you attain a degree, but obtain a diploma. So when you um, pass a degree or diploma, you get a certificate. So you can say, I have obtained a diploma degree. But, um, but when you are only talking about the degree itself, now you can't say degree. It's just a thing that you have just achieved. So you can say, I have attained a degree. But and as a proof of that, you have a certificate that you have obtained. So that's the basic difference um, between obtain and attain. All right. Um, another another pair of words two 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 again um this can be quite confusing for some of the people and um again i have seen many people make this mistake when they are writing because when you are speaking about two it's all the same when you are pronouncing um so the main mistake happens um when you write um, um in, in in your essay or somewhere else and you're using the wrong spelling uh you're trying to say um, and trying to show a different one, but you're writing another spelling. Um, and that's when it becomes a mistake. So TWO or two, everyone knows that it's just a number two, um, one, two, three for that two. So I don't have to go into detail about that two. Um, everyone knows that. Uh, so the main confusion arises between TO2 and TO2. So TO2 is just a preposition. Okay, so for example, I went to the shop, I went to my class, um, all these type of things when you are trying to show where you have been to, to talk about a place you have been, that's when you use preposition to. Um, you can also use TO2 to, to talk about a period of time. For example, he works from nine to, two, nine to five or the live stream, um, you know, every Thursday we have a live stream from 5.30 to 6.30. So again, we are using two. So when you are talking about a period of time with a beginning and ending time, you can use two. Um, but T002, it just means something excessive, something like very or also, for example, um, if I say after the live stream, I'm just too tired. Uh, or if you say after, after, after doing a class for like an hour, I am just too tired. So it just means I am very tired. I'm exhausted. So in that situation, you use T double O. You can also use T double O to say, um, I, for example, I uh, did this. I also did that. So you can say, I'm writing, but I am reading too. It just means I'm doing that also. Um, another situation where you can use T double O means when you have added something extra excessive in something, for example, you have added too much flour. So it means um, you have added excessive things in your flower or anywhere else. So that's two and two. From Julie, um, yes, that's exactly my mistake. Yeah, I know, right? Um, see, I read your mind. Um, so I hope from next time, Julie, you are not gonna make the same mistake and you're not gonna be confused. Just remember when you have T double O, two O in the word, 
it just means something extra. It's just excessive, extra, very, these type of things, because there is two or, not one. Uh, but when you have just T-O, only T-O, two, that just means preposition, like the normal two. So yeah, and T-W-O, two, we all know that. I don't have to explain that. Um, so yeah, another example of two, two, two. So the fox has two years. It means just two years. Um, I ate too much means I just ate in excessive amount. Um, and I love to swim. It means a preposition, like I love to do something. Just talking about that. So that's CO2. All right. Okay. This one similar to 222. They are, they are, they are. It can also be sometimes confusing. Um, what is the meaning of what? Because the pronunciation is same. So when you are speaking, the mistake is not detectable. But um, when you write, it becomes very obvious. Um, from fun, I'm always confused about say, hi between everyone versus everybody. Um, fun, it's the same, okay? Everyone, everybody, it doesn't have that much difference. It's, it's the same. When you're adding in a sentence, everyone or everybody, it just means including everyone in the room or wherever you are, okay? So if I say hi, everyone, or if I say hi, everybody, it will have same meaning. So yeah, I don't think it's a big trouble. Okay, let's focus on um, they are, they are, they are. So T-H-E-I-R, they are. The first one, it just means possession. Like it is their house, it is their book. Um, it just means something belonging to someone, um, a possession. That is T-H-E-I-R. T-H-E-R-E, they are. It just means a position of a person. Um, for example, um, there is a tree or there is a house um, where he is standing or where he is living um, in that house. So when we say there, it just means some place and nothing else. When we are using T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, they are, it's, it's just a short form, the contraction uh, of they are. So when we are talking informally with someone or chatting or texting someone um, and we don't want to write the full form of they are, you can just say they apostrophe are, e, they are. It's just a short form and nothing else. So let's look at another picture to make sure we understand. Um, you are welcome, Fan. So they are, if we look at the picture, they are in the left, in the right-hand side, the first picture, they are, it just means husband and wife in this picture. Two people, they are, it's just a short form. And the middle picture, they are, it's just showing the location of a house, their house, these two people's house, they are. Um, and the last one, T-H-E-I-R, um, it just shows, they are dog. This dog belongs to them. So we can say they are dog. Um, if you look closely to the picture, there is an arrow sign uh, after the dog. So it's just showing this dog belongs to them. So we can say this is their dog. Um, this is their pet. Um, so it just means this dog or this pet belongs to this couple, these people. So I think that's, that's a good way of showing how to use and where to use there with T-H-E-I-R and T-H-E-R-E, there.
um, and the other one is the contraction of they are. So, yeah. Like and as. So these two words again can be used um, interchangeably. Like people use interchangeably, but that's not the case because there is a difference between the uses of like and as. So you want to um, add as when you are trying, sorry, you want to use like when you want to try to compare between two things. For example, this book looks like that book. So we are comparing this book, one book with another book. So when you are trying to compare two things, one with another, we use like, okay? For example, if we say he looks as Oscar Wilde, this is not grammatically correct because we are trying to compare him with Oscar. Um, and when you are trying to compare, you use like. So we can say he looks like Oscar Wilde. In the same way, the little girl as her mother has bright red hair. So if we say as her mother, it's not correct because we are trying to here compare the little girl's hair with her mother's hair. So when you're trying to do that, you can say the little girl, like her mother, has bright red hair. So the rule of thumb is when you are trying to compare two things, you can use like. Simple as that. You don't have to use as. Now the question arises, when to use as? So let's look at it. So... When you are trying to write a sentence or say a sentence where you can say the word, the phrase, the way, the way, you can replace the way with as. For example, no one makes chocolate cake like my mother does. That's grammatically incorrect. You can say, no one makes chocolate cake the way my mother does. Or it can say, no one makes chocolate cake as my mother does. So in every situation where you can use the, word, the phrase the way, you can replace the way with as. It's, it's not just simple comparison, like one thing with another one. It's beyond that. It's more than that. You are just talking about um, what happens um, and what someone does similar to other person, the way, the process of doing something. So when you're talking about the process of doing something, the way someone does something, then you use as, not like. But when you are trying to compare things between two people or two, two objects, that's when you use like. All right. Compliment and compliment. Pronunciation-wise, it's same. Um, the spelling is a little different, um, and also the meaning is different as well. Compliment and compliment. So simply, compliment with I is praising, praising someone, admiring someone, saying something nice to someone. Um, you can remember this this way, like praise has I in, 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 in its spelling, and compliment with I is the same meaning. It has the same meaning. Compliment with I has the same meaning as praise because both have I in their spelling. On the other hand, complement with E in the middle, it just means making something complete. For example, if I go to a restaurant and order dinner item or lunch item, um, and then sometimes we, we, in the menu of a restaurant, they have an option for a complimentary dish, a complimentary menu. It just means some sweet dishes maybe to complement, to complete whatever food you just had, to enrich that experience, to, to make you feel complete about whatever you ate. So anything that enhances, that enriches, that completes another thing, you can use complement in that situation. For example, if we look at the, if we look at the picture of complement, we can see 
Two people are talking. So the man is saying, your smile complements your bright outfit. So it just simply means that person is trying to say like you have wore a bright outfit and your smile just completes the overall look. It makes it complete. And the girl is saying, we complement each other. It just means we complete each other. When we have um, each other's support, when we go somewhere with each other, we look like complete people. We look like a complete couple, maybe couple or friends. I don't know. Uh, but it just means they have a sense of perfection. They have a sense of complete uh, feeling, full fullness. So that's when you use complement. Um, so the complement has E. The word complete also has E in it. So that way you can, um, you know, remember the things, which one means what. And compliment is praise. You know that it, it's just simple. Um, another one, um, confused with principle and principle, borrow and lend. Um, very interesting. Okay. I hope I can help and I remember the right information. Um, so principle uh, with P-L-E in the end, it just means rules. Like that's the principle of the world, the principle of universal, like the rules and regulations, okay? And principle with P-A-L in the end, that just means main person or the head of something, like school's principle, okay? Um, or... If you want to say, who is the principal person here? Who is the main person here? Who is the head in charge here? That's when we use principal with P-A-L in the end. But if you're talking about rules and regulations, the way of doing something, uh, laws, then we use principal with P-L-E. All right? That's one thing. Uh, borrow and lend. Uh, borrow means taking something from someone. For example, um, I like your dress and I can say, can I borrow it? So borrow means taking and lending means giving. So I can say, yes, all right. I can lend that dress to you if you want. So basically borrow and lend both means temporarily taking something from someone. But the difference is borrow means taking the one who is going to take it. They will use the word borrow. But the one who will give it, they will use the word lend, not borrow. I hope that makes if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, if I want to take something from someone, I'll say I want to borrow it. And the other person who has it and they want to give it to me, they will say, all right, I can lend it to you. And principle and principle, if I want to say like, what is the principle of using complement and complement in a sentence? So what is the rule of using uh, complement and complement? Um, that is P-L-E. And in the end, P-A-L, I'll say, who is the person in charge here? Like, who is the principal person here to talk about administrative stuff, for example? So that would be principal, the main person, the head person, um, or the person in charge somewhere especially in school and administrative stuff. Um, I think that's the difference. All right. Moving on to another two different words, effect and effect. This is another something which is really confusing sometimes. So effect with A, is, it's a verb. Effect with E is a noun. Okay, that's the basic difference. Um, so when you are saying something is affected by someone or something is being influenced, you want to talk about influence, then you use effect with A to bring change, to produce change in someone or something. And effect with E is just the outcome of it, the consequence, the result of it. For example, if we look at the Mm, second picture, like on the left-hand side, 
acute person is being sold in rain. So rain is the effect. Rain is affecting. Rain is influencing. And being soaked in rainwater, being drenched in rainwater is the outcome. So, uh, so if, if you are walking in the rain, what will be the outcome? What will be the consequence? I will be soaked. I'll be drenched, right? So that's the thing. Effect with E is the consequence. And effect with a, that's a verb. It means it's trying to influence something or someone is trying to change something and ch or someone trying to bring change in something or someone. So another example, pollution negatively affects the environment. So pollution negatively changes the environment. So effect is a verb because it is doing something. Verb means acting or doing something. So uh, pollution negatively affects, uh, so it's, it's bringing change. Um, and effect with E, exercise and healthy eating have positive effects. So if you exercise regularly, if you eat healthy foods, it will have positive outcome. It will have positive consequence. So that's the difference between effect and effect. Please don't make these mistakes from next time because, um, because in, in essay, for example, in PTE essay, there will be some uh, problem solution essays, advantage, disadvantages essay about any topic. And that's exactly why you have to use these words like effect, effect, and make sure next time when you're writing effect with A or effect with E, you know the difference and you are using it appropriately. Okay, moving on very quickly to read aloud mistakes. The first mistake that I really want to emphasize, don't chew your words, chew your breakfast or any other food. So what is the meaning of chewing words? It just means you are not opening up properly. Okay, you are not opening your mouth properly. You are just putting your teeth together and you're pronouncing in a very weird way the words um, and it's not clear. That's what exactly means chewing your words. Like for example, if I start speaking with my teeth um, together, with my lips, uh, lips closer together and not open my mouth good enough, you are not going to understand what I'm saying, okay? So that means we have to open up, we have to open our mouth, we have to pronounce the words in exactly the way it should be pronounced. So what happens is when we are talking to each other in face-to-face -face conversation, we don't, we not only focus on what they are saying, we also read their lip movement, right? Uh, you're looking at their face and even if you don't understand so many things, you get an idea what they're talking about from their from their lip movement, from reading their face and everything. But the in PTE test, computer is not reading your face. Computer is not tracking your lip movement. Computer is not tracking your mouth movement. It's just tracking what you are saying. It's, it's just tracking what you are delivering to it. So if you want to make sure like the PTE uh, AI tracks every word correctly that you are saying, you have to do an extra, extra work. The extra work is you have to make sure all the words have clarity, okay? When you are pronouncing each word, every syllable should be pronounced correctly. When you are pronouncing a word, stress should be given in exact letters that where, you, where you should be giving it. Uh, because otherwise, what happens, the computer cannot track what you are saying. So if you speak too slow or too fast, or maybe you are, your speaking speed is fine, but you are not speaking in a way you should be speaking. You are, you are chewing it. You are putting everything inside your mouth. It becomes really hard to get a good point in speaking section. Okay. For example, I am a good boy. If spoken too quickly, may sound like I'm a good boy. Now, even if you don't speak too quickly, maybe you are speaking normally. If you don't pronounce I very clearly, 
the computer cannot track it. The computer will simply track, I'm a good boy. I will be missing, okay? So when you're reading it aloud, you have to say, I am a good boy, very clearly and separately each and every word, putting stress where it should be given. So this is one thing people make mistake with. They are not clear about what they are saying. Every word does not have clarity when they speak in the microphone and it will negatively impact our score in speaking. So this is the first mistake and don't repeat it again. Second mistake, not raising your voice. So it just means when you are using microphone, you are speaking in a very low voice. You are trying to whisper, not trying to be loud. Um, and then the computer again has problem in tracking what you are trying to say. The task's name is read aloud, right? We have to a little bit louder when we are trying to speak. We can't mumble or whisper in our microphone. Now, even if you don't whisper, if you are very, if your voice is very slow, uh, if you are not pronouncing every word loud enough, the microphone's receptors cannot receive or track your voice, whatever you are saying. And it's not going to give you a score. So please, from next time, when you are trying to say something in read aloud, make sure you are loud enough, you are clear enough, you are pronouncing every word clearly and separately, um, and you are not too fast or too slow. So this is the second mistake people usually make, um, not raising their voice. Let's look at the third mistake because we are going to cover six mistakes. So let's, let's focus on the third one. Now, before we move on, these are some speech reminders, the right way of speaking. Okay. First, from the first picture on the left-hand side, say every sound in each word. Okay. This is number one rule. When you are using and pronouncing a word, say every word that is necessary to to pronounce that word. For example, if we say mom, we have to say mom um, very clearly. M in the beginning, M in the end will have stress in it. So when you want to say mom or mom or mother, you have to know where to put stress um, and do that accordingly. Use a strong voice. So having bold, confident and loud voice is really important. Talk slowly. Now, this slowly doesn't mean doesn't mean being really, really slowly. It just means not rushing through, okay? Not to be too quick to finish your reading. Use good posture. This is highly, highly important. I have seen difference in people's um, speaking quality when they change their movement, when they change their posture. If you are doing read aloud lying, laying on your bed, or if you are trying to do read aloud while walking, it will be different compared to when you are sitting on a table in a proper position, on a chair, uh, putting your laptop on the table and set, trying to record yourself using a microphone. That way your reading score will be very different from doing the same thing, sitting on a sofa or a couch or in a bed or while walking or running. Posture makes a difference um, and it makes a difference in a very positive way. So when you, when you are practicing at home, make sure you have a good posture and you are trying, you, you do it most of the time sitting on your study table, uh, putting the laptop on the table, not on your lap, not putting the laptop anywhere else. It should be on the table. You should be sitting on a chair uh, putting your legs on the floor, not like, you know, bending it in a very weird way and using proper microphone. So these are the things you have to keep in mind when you're giving the mini test, mock test, or even practicing every day. Um, and also opening your mouth for vowels, um, knowing when to open our mouth or when to put stress and everything. Uh, if you follow these rules, your speech will be much more clear, much more, you know, intelligible. 
uh, it will be understandable. It will be much more, it will have much more clarity. So move your lips, move your mouth, uh, be much more vocal, um, put stress and be much more clear when you are trying to say something. These tips are really going to help and boost your reading aloud, read aloud score. Number three, not stressing on plural word endings. Um, what to say about it? Um, so many people do the same mistake. They just forget maybe to pronounce the last, the ending S in a word. Um, and if you do that, um, it's going to be a huge problem. All right. Because you are not going to get the score for that word if you don't add S with that word, if it has in the read aloud passage. So if you speak very quickly or if you're not attentive enough, this is what happens. The S, in the, the S at the tail of a word, at the end of a word, gets lost somewhere. Um, and you lose so many points for that. Especially these type of mistakes happen when in one sentence, so many words have S in the end. For example, let's look at this example. All these sweaters soaked in water are ready for washing. So sweaters has S, soaked also begins with S. So when you have the words like these together um, with S in it, it becomes confused, confusing and sometimes really hard for people to pronounce both S clearly. So in that situation, what you can do is if you have punctuation, if you have comma or full stop, pause there. For example, here in this example, we have comma after sweaters. So if you put a little bit pause for like a fraction of a second, that way you can pronounce sweaters. And after the break, you can also pronounce soaked. Both A's will be pronounced exactly the same way. So you can say all these sweaters soaked in water are ready for washing. So both A's are pronounced. Now, if you don't have um, a punctuation in the middle, that's also fine. You can give yourself a fraction of second pause by yourself. So you can just randomly pause because even if we don't have punctuation in a sentence, we can't just keep speaking uh, continuously. We need to take break in the middle, right? So maybe take that break in the middle of a sentence, even when you don't have punctuation. So you can say, all these sweaters soaked in water are ready for washing. But make sure you're, you pronounce sweaters S and soaked S both exactly in a very clear way so the computer uh, can track it. So this is another thing. Number four, not stressing on past form of verb endings with ed in the end. This is, an, this is another frequently, you know, people make mistake with um, and also lose a lot of marks um, in read aloud for that. And also not only in read aloud, but also I think in repeat sentence. In repeat sentence, if they're using a past tense, a past form of verb with ed, and when you are repeating it, you are not adding ed, you are not going to get any point for that word. So, it's like losing easy points just for being careless. Uh, and we should not do that. So sometimes for some words, when they have ED in it, it becomes really difficult to pronounce. Uh, for example, the word bathed, asked, breathed, framed. These words have ED in the end and it can be very hard for you um, to to pronounce it exactly in the same way. Um, what you have to do is you just have to practice pronouncing. And if you have struggle, you can always just go to Google and you know search for the pronunciation of this word. And it will show you with leaf, move, with leaf movement how to pronounce this word correctly. And repeat following that instruction, repeat the word several times and you will be good to go. And if you are someone um, who knows that you have a problem with pronouncing ED, every single time you are going to do read aloud, keep this thing in your mind. Like, this is my weak area. This is where I make mistakes with. So now when I'm going to read it, when I'm going to come across a past tense, 
a past form of verb, I'm going to make sure if there is ed in the end or not. If there is ed, I'll take extra step to make sure I pronounce it correctly. So if you know your areas of improvement, if you know where you are lacking, you can easily take some extra steps, extra caution to make sure everything goes very smoothly, all right? But make sure if it is your weak area, work on it because otherwise you will be losing so many easy points um, from read aloud and also repeat sentence. So stressing on ED is very important and please give more attention into this thing. So that is um, four. Number five, stammering frequently. So sometimes when we are nervous, when we are stressed, when we are anxious, we stammer when we are reading a sentence. What happens is in the process of stammering, we add some extra letters, some extra words in the middle of a sentence. So for example, um, if, if the sentence is, I was reading a book during my class, this is a sentence, but if you're stammering because of nervousness, if you have an issue of stammering, that's a different thing. But if you don't have an issue of stammering, if it's simply because you are nervous and anxious, in that situation, what will happen? You will say, I was um, um, reading a book um, uh, during my um, class, something like that. So in the process, you're going to add a lot of extra words, a lot of extra letters, which are not there in the passage. And the computer will think um, this person is reading it in a wrong way um, because this is not a part of the sentence. The computer is not going to understand that you are nervous, you are stressed, and you are stammering. So this is another thing. If, if you have this problem of being nervous, make sure you keep yourself calm and confident before you start your read aloud. You have to work on yourself. You have to find your own way of how to, you can reduce or control or carve this problem of stammering because that, that also gonna cost you points um, in read aloud. Last mistake, not knowing the pronunciation of some very similar words. Um, even if the pronunciation is pretty similar, it's not exactly the same. For example, let's look at these words. Accept and accept. Both are like, you know, similar in pronunciation. But if you notice in the beginning of the words, they are different. For example, when we say the first word, we say accept, accept. But when we say ex, we say accept. So in the beginning, there is a difference. When we say H-A-I-R, hair, simple hair. But when we say H-E-R-E, -E, we say here. We don't say hair, we say here. So there is again a difference. F-L-O-U-R, that is flower, flower. F-L-O-O-R, that is floor. So even if they were the, these words um, pretty similar, spelling is also very close to each other, pronunciation is different. And this pronunciation will make a difference also in your pronunciation score in PTE. You can't say H-A-I-R -A and H-E-R-E -E in the same way because those are different with a different meaning and different spelling. And the pronunciation is also different. So if you are someone who is always confused about these closely related words, um, make sure you know the difference between the pronunciation before you sit for the test. So these are the six mistakes and we are left with one more thing, which is the myth. So the myth is many people believe changing PTE test center gives you different test score. Like if you give first time your test in test center A um, and next time um, you want to go to the test center B, it is going to give you a different test score. Obviously, no, it's not going to be that different one because most of the question sets are very similar in all of the test centers throughout the world. Um, so the only thing that can make a difference in your test score is your preparation and taking charge and taking control of areas where you need more improvement. Because 90% of the questions in every test center are same. 
all right? So you can't expect today I give my test in, in test center A and without changing anything in my preparation, without taking more preparation or changing what I'm doing wrong, if I, if I go to test center B the next morning and sit for the test, I'll dramatically have a different score. It doesn't work like that, okay? The only thing you can do is change your practice pattern, preparation way. Um, if you're doing something in a wrong way, take feedback from trainers or take suggestion from another friend who has passed the test. Modify your preparation, your way of you know, preparing for the test and then sit for the test. Even if you go for the same test center again, you are going to have a different score because you change your strategies. You change the way you practice um, your questions for PDE, all right? so. Don't believe in these things because there are a lot of people, you know, talking like go to this test center, go to that test center. This test center has an easier question bank. Another test center has hard question bank. That's not true. Um, the only thing that makes difference is you and your preparation. All right. Um, I think I'm done for tonight. Um, I have covered all of these things um, that I wanted to share with all of you. And I hope those information were quite helpful. Um, from Julie, thanks. Um, very helpful. I'm so glad, Julie, um, that it was helpful. And I hope you got more insight into how and where to improve English language thing um, and how to improve read aloud and exactly what to do. Uh, from Jess, amazing. Oh, no problem, Jess. I'm very glad you appreciate it. My pleasure. So yeah, everyone, just let me know if you have more question or concern on anything that we have covered today. Um, I'll be more than happy to take the question and help you if I can. Or maybe just simply give me your feedback. How was the session? How helpful was it uh, to improve your English proficiency? Uh, from fun, I know that there are so many mistakes. So today we have just talked about 13 ones most common and it makes me think of buying you iPhone. Hope to see you later for more helpful tips to avoid others mistake. Yes, fun. Um, yeah, that's true. I am planning to bring on some more frequently common mistakes so that we become much more aware of what we are doing, because sometimes we don't even realize that we are making a mistake. So it's really useful to know where we are lacking and where to improve. Um, but fun, I didn't real, I didn't, uh, you know, understand the connection between buying a new iPhone with with most frequently make made mistakes. Can you just clarify me on that? Um, from Gwen, thanks. Notion, it is really helpful for me. I'm really glad, Gwen, that it really helped you out. Please stay tuned and come back um, on next Thursday to learn about more frequently made mistakes on English language. Uh, from Millie, I have gained a lot of knowledge. Thanks, uh, Notion, so much. I'm so happy, Millie, that you have learned um, new things um, and acknowledge that we are lacking somewhere and uh, we need to fix that before we sit for pd right it's it's not all these sessions these live stream sessions are not only designed to improve your pd score but also to improve your overall english proficiency and knowing exactly what we are doing and how it should be doing in a right way so yeah Millie, thanks so much for your feedback it really helps and motivates me to come up with new content to help all of you All right, so maybe we end today from Tina. Thanks for today. See you next Thursday. Yeah, Tina, I'll, I'm going to see you in, in our class and next in live, in next week's live stream session as well. All right, people. So um, for from fun, the new. Yeah, I, I have seen fun um, in different social media. iPhone 13 is released. Um, and it was okay. Yeah, now it makes sense. iPhone 13 and 13 mistakes. 
Yeah, no, no, yeah. Yeah, you're smart. Yeah, that's true. Um, I have to buy an iPhone 13 as well. I'm a crazy fan of iPhone. So yeah. Anyway, um, thanks for, fun for the clarification and let's end for tonight. Have a lovely night ahead. Good night. Have a safe night. Have a lovely dinner, everyone. Um, I'm going to see everyone again back on our next Thursday live session. All right. Till then, stay safe, stay healthy. All right. Bye, everyone.